And with no further ado, Robert, feel free to share your screen and begin. Thank you. All right, awesome. Uh, thank you, Azar, and thank you everyone so much for the invitation to present today. Uh, it's really nice to uh, present to a group of folks that are ocean centric and shellfish friendly. Uh, so I think you will enjoy some of the things we're talking about. So I think what I'm going to do is I will talk for probably about 20, 25 minutes and overview some of the um, some key uh, updates on our science program and a recent document we developed called the Principle, Principles of Restorative Aquaculture. And then also talk to you a little bit about some of our work that's touching down on the ground in the Northeast. Um, does that sound good? And we have some time. Do we have a full hour? We do. Thank you. That sounds perfect. And we'll have everyone reserve your, your questions for a QA and a at the end. And feel free to keep track of them in the chat. Okay. Anyone can post them there. And we'll so I'm going to go to share screen here. And from the beginning. Okay. Looks good. Perfect. Um, so we're some of you probably know the Nature Conservancy quite well. Uh, we are a global organization. Uh, we work um, around the world now in 74 countries, and we have programs in all 50 states, including Rhode Island, uh, which has had an ocean-focused program for a number of years. Uh, we have about a million donors, 1,300 volunteers. I think one thing that's um, unique about our TNC work is the heavy focus and orientation towards science. Uh, we have 4,000 conservation practitioners and, and over 400 of us are scientists. And um, we've recently gone through at TNC a new um, strategic planning process that culminated last year. Uh, it's called our Shared Conservation Agenda. And we're now focused at, on three things at TNC. One is uh, tackling climate change. The second is protecting lands oceans and freshwater. And the third is providing food and water sustainably for future generations. And our work on aquaculture, as well as fisheries and agriculture fit within that food, food systems priority. So that's increasingly the way we're looking at um, this work. Uh, in terms of like what's going on at TNC currently on aquaculture, we have um, four different verticals uh, that are going on in our global program in which I sit. Um, we have uh, a program called SOAR, the Supporting Oyster Aquaculture and Restoration Program, which is focused on, has been historically focused on COVID relief support for oyster growers uh, and accelerating reef restoration during COVID-19. We have a big initiative currently around seaweed aquaculture, uh, primarily working around the world with smallholder farmers uh, in developing world contexts uh, in Indonesia, Tanzania, uh, as well as Belize uh, to develop seaweed as a livelihood opportunity as an alternative or supplemental income to fishing and to create environmental co-benefits in terms of habitat provision and nutrient removal. Uh, we have a financing priority, which is ramping up. Uh, we're currently working with a, um, a aquaculture organization called Hatch Blue, which is based in Bergen, Norway, to set up uh, the world's first uh, impact-oriented invest aquaculture investment fund. And under that fund, uh, TNC will serve as a conservation manager of the fund. So we review projects, uh, investment projects based on environmental criteria, uh, and Hatch serves as the role of the investment advisor. So a unique collaboration uh, where the fund size is targeted to be about 75 million euro and we'll invest into uh, bivalve and seaweed farms, uh, as well as emerging technologies in the aquaculture space, which meet the intersection of conservation objectives to improve ocean health, as well as uh, improve financial returns. Uh, and finally, we have a, a program focused on science and tools for the aquaculture industry. A lot of that work has been focused on um, identifying and quantifying the ecosystem services associated with bivalve and seaweed aquaculture. But we also have some work with the finfish aquaculture sector, which focuses on developing uh, state-of-the-art decision support tools for a growing industry. So a lot of that work is around spatial planning and siting for aquaculture operations, taking and using remote sensing techniques and tools to help identify um, optimal aquaculture sites. And we've done that work uh, overseas uh, in the country of Palau, as well as here in the United States. 
Uh, where are we working today? Uh, Nature Conservancy's aquaculture program was working in a subset of the 74 countries that TNC works. Uh, this chart kind of shows where these initiatives currently are around the world, and you'll see a lot of the work has been on bivalves and seaweed, but increasingly in some other species groups as, as well. So um, as a U.S.-based organization, we do have still some focus in this area, but um, glad to talk about some of the international projects too, if there's questions in the end. All right, so we'll get this out of the way too, in terms of housekeeping. Uh, this is what our team kind of looks like. Uh, we've, we are um, a globally oriented team and we're based mostly in the US and also in Australia. So there's five of us that work on aquaculture at a global level and we work through conservancy staff uh, on the ground. There's probably 25 people at the conservancy that are working on aquaculture issues today. Uh, but we also rely heavily on collaborations and partnerships uh, with academic institutions, government, par government partners, uh, and industry partners to get, get our work done. All right, so um, now onto the meat of it. We recently came out with this report uh, in November, 2021 called the Global Principles of Restorative Aquaculture. And we had seen a lot of interest in this, this subject. Uh, we've been promoting this program around restorative aquaculture since 20, 2016. And as I had mentioned earlier, we've been investing into global level scientific studies, quantifying the ecosystem services, kind of review, review papers on, on this topic. And we finally got to a point where it was like, we need to really flush this out in terms of a, a, um, a white paper or peer reviewed document that expresses what is restorative aquaculture? Can we agree on a definition on what that is and how do you go about doing it? Uh, and we felt the time was ripe to do that because we're seeing the term increasingly be used in a variety of different contexts. And you know, without a better definition, it's uh, it, you know there's a risk that the term could be uh, misused or co-opted for something different than what it means. Um, so this is one of our objectives here was to bring kind of clarity to that. So uh, we um, developed this paper over a period of maybe a year and a half uh, with a group of international co-authors and it offers you know, obje uh, objectives for conducting restorative aquaculture, a new definition, reviews the environmental benefits of restorative aquaculture, identifies key principles to undertake uh, in developing it, and gives roadmaps to execute as well as case studies. Um, this was quite a process and like part of developing this paper was uh, to ensure that we do have uh, a uh, significant buy-in from globally important organizations working on aquaculture to undertake this exercise. What we really did not want to do is go in this with a uh, perspective that, you know, this is a TNC concept and, you know, other groups don't buy into it. So we went at lengths to, to run two processes concurrently, actually one in China uh, with a number of Chinese researchers, and then also a global level working group that we conducted in English, uh, which incorporated a number of global level authors. So we had workshops in China, we had brought together about 50 scientists to discuss restorative aquaculture and provide input into this document. Um, and then we had uh, representation from groups like the FAO, the World Bank, World Li Wildlife Fund, the Global Environmental Facility, uh, NOAA and several others. Um, the reason we thought uh, um, China was so important to work on this is outside of the United States, China has actually produced some, some of the most uh, significant research in terms of the environmental effects of bivalve and seaweed culture or environmental effects of aquaculture in the surrounding environment. But it's actually really hard to access that information. Um, that information is often not making it into the spheres of scientific literature. Uh, in English language. So we thought that was really important to do. Uh, we we're very lucky to have a team based in China that works on aquaculture uh, with my team. We're able to hold these listening sessions and, and workshops with them. So um, we thought that was, that was great. And the Mandarin language version of this document is coming out soon. So I think we probably covered this already. Uh, the, 
purposes of this were to establish a definition for restorative aquaculture, describe the key benefits and environmental conditions that result from restorative aquaculture, create guidance for resource managers, regulators, farming associations, and farmers, uh, motivate key actors to plan for and deploy restorative aquaculture practices, and to support implementation, measurement, and valuation of restorative aquaculture in practice. So what did the team come up with in terms of the de definition? So uh, this working group came up with a definition of uh, restorative aquaculture is commercial or subsistence aquaculture that provides direct ecological benefits to the environment with the potential to generate net positive environmental outcomes. Uh, so I think the, the key uh, phrases within this sentence are commercial or, or subsistence, right? It's a, it's a commercial generating activity and net positive, like the, the goal, ultimate goal being net positive environmental outcomes of the surrounding environment. Um, and I think this graphic actually does a good job at explaining the concept, right? Where so, some of the more traditional concepts in sustainable management of aquaculture aim basically exclusive, exclusively on impact reduction, right? How do you do aquaculture in a way with lesser impact on the environment? Well, this aims to kind of go beyond that, to go beyond just reduction of impacts and to actually try to create positive benefits for the surrounding ecosystems. So um, we see this as a continuum, right? Where, you know, we may never actually get all the way over to the farthest part of this scale in most operations, but as a, as a goal to drive forward, I think it's an important one. I think it, uh, another context here at TNC is well, this kind of thinking, uh, is connected with a broader theme right now in food systems in terms of regenerative food production. And that's a big priority for us at TNC is to find ways that uh, of producing food that reduce impacts across all food production sectors and move towards uh, ecologically positive or nature positive types of production. So in land agriculture, that's looked like, you know, things like incorporating uh, more habitat on farmland or, you know, things like no-till pra farming practices, which bring more carbon into the soil and increase carbon production. Um, and in aquaculture, we're seeing some of the highest opportunity areas in the bivalve and seaweed space, which have some pretty significant um, uh, opportunities around um, ecosystem service provision. But, you know, the first step as, as, is always, I think, the case and when we're looking at environmental impacts of food production operations is to avoid or minimize that, that impact in the first place. And then further from that, you kind of move towards mitigating those impacts and then designing ecological design for improvement of, of operations. So um, now I'll note that there's some other definitions in the literature that deviate slightly from this definition uh, but I think this is a this is a good one. I think we have 12 major global organizations now buying into this, and we're getting greater interest and in adoption of the, of this idea and concept. All right, so I just mentioned um, where we we've seen the the highest opportunity for restorative aquaculture in the aquaculture subsectors, which has been in the bivalve and seaweed production, and probably to many of you, this is rudimentary, but the general concepts are um, the removal of nitrogen from coastal waterways, the filtration and water quality improvements that can come from, from aquaculture operations, which can be some, quite significant in some water bodies. Um, the fish production benefits, the habitat provisioning, which occurs through, um, you know, provision of forage or refuge areas, um, or even breeding grounds for uh, fish and invertebrates. Um, and then additionally, there's an opportunity for climate and climate sequestration through seaweed aquaculture, uh, as well as ocean acidification mitigation. Now, that's an earlier area of uh, research, and um, the working group was quite transparent about that in the materials that were developed uh, uh, here in terms of roadmaps. So what do we come up with in terms of principles uh, to guide restorative aquaculture, which is what are the underlying drivers that 
determine whether an aquaculture operation is going to have a positive or more likely to have a positive environmental outcome or not. Uh, so how, what should we be thinking about while we're doing this? So this is what, these are the list of six principles that appear in the report. Um, the first one, which probably might not surprise folks, it relates to siting. Um, it's been our experience that farm sites are really critically important for uh, whether a farm has a positive uh, impact on the positive benefits to the environment or negative impacts to the environment. Uh, they, so things to think through here, like let's just take the, the context of, you know, nutrient mitigation. If we're try, striving to remove nutrients from the coastal environment, right, not all water bodies are ones that suffer from nutrient challenges, right? So, um, you know, take some place with like the Gulf of Maine where, you know, eutrophication isn't as a significant pro problem as it is in, let's say, the southern New England in most estuaries there. So siting is important consideration and how you, how you uh, go about selecting sites for the environmental benefit that you're choosing to address through aquaculture. Uh, culturing species that provide the intended environmental benefits, right? So the idea here is that certain species are better at providing environmental benefits than others, as well as farming equipment, um, which is the third principle. So certain gear types, um, certain species are likely to provide more or less benefits than others. Uh, we actually ran a study on um, the relative, we completed a peer-reviewed study on the habitat benefits of uh, shellfish and seaweed aquaculture recently, and mussels turned out to be one of the best uh, performing species groups in terms of the habitat benefits that are provided in terms of species abundance in and around farms. And, you know, there's a reason for that, like the canopy that's created by the mussel farm is more likely to, it makes sense, it would bring uh, more habitat uh, related to surrounding, um, surrounding environment. Okay, principle four, adopting farm management practices that can enhance local ecological environmental benefits um, is pretty straightforward. When we're thinking about practices, it's like how, how do farmers operate their farm? When are they putting gear in and out of the water? How are they maintaining that gear? How are they cleaning the gear? These kind of things. Uh, principle five, the intensity and scale of culture uh, that, that can enhance ecosystem outcomes. So Intensity and scale of culture are also drivers of uh, the environmental benefits that a farm can provide. You know, think about, you know, nutrient mitigation is a goal, right? There is, you know, some level, if the farm is very small in comparison to the water body or the farming industry is small in comparison to the water body, it may have, you know, less of an impact on, on water quality. Um, so that's an important consideration and often carrying capacity type modeling is necessary to kind of try to answer these questions um, in terms of the appropriate levels of farming. Uh, and finally, six, recognizing the social and economic value provided by uh, restorative aquaculture. And part of this draws to the um, recognition as it plays out in the marketplace, recognition as it plays out in the permitting systems, but also moving to this concept of compensation for ecosystem services. And that's in, in its early days, uh, basically piloted and actually some farms receiving credits already in the Chesapeake Bay, some of that being worked on in, uh, in Massachusetts as well. Grab me another muffin. Oh yeah, sure. Uh, so the report then goes into uh, roadmaps and how to actually do this. And um, the way the team decided to go about this was to develop flowcharts. And uh, the point and purpose of this was to be able to make a, a reasonably good, uh, provide reasonably good information on whether or not the farm is likely or not likely to provide restorative benefits based on a simple set of questions. Now there's ways to do this empirically as well. And you can set up a science experiment around the farm. We've done that a number of times. That's pretty expensive to do. Uh, some of these studies control uh, before, after backy style designs or control uh, type designs 
take a lot of time and cost you know hundreds of thousands of dollars to run and we'll continue to do that and invest in the science but um the information we're looking to generate here is like for your average farmer um you know based on this flow chart is, are the practices you, that you're achieving likely to provide a positive benefit to the surrounding environment. So what you do is you kind of work down the chart from the top left and move towards the bottom right uh, based on that. And depending upon the environmental objective that you're trying to achieve, we've developed a different roadmap. So this one kind of works through the water quality benefits for uh, a seaweed or bivalve farm. Uh, and whether or not it's more likely or not to result in environmental benefits. Okay, so we did a similar uh, sort of flow chart on habitat benefits. You know, the stuff on the top left of the screen here is more in relation to, you know, threat mitigation. You know, if you're not doing some of these basic things to mitigate or avoid your impacts in the first place, you're going to get this not likely restorative answer. Uh, and as you move towards the right side, uh, some of these are uh, asking more questions about the additive nature of the operation and whether or not uh, the farm is likely to achieve that. All right, we kind of brought this down to ground in several case studies in the report. We looked at um, two examples in the bivalve and seaweed sec sectors, the Chesapeake Bay and the mitigation nutrient mitigation question. There's been a lot of work there uh, to look specifically about oyster farming practices in the Chesapeake Bay and incorporating that into regulatory policy under the EPA's total maximum daily load. So we go through that entire case example and look at it uh, and look at what the projected environmental out outcomes are and run it in relation to the flow charts that we've just developed. Um, we took a sort of different example with Belize where it's an industry that's in very early stages, there's only a few farms in the country. Um, the environmental objective there, alongside you know, provision of livelihood, has been to design farms in a way with that create um, habitat provisioning benefits to the surrounding environment. Um, you can see trigger fish in this picture, but actually, the fishermen that are working with us on these seaweed farming projects are most interested in creating habitat for spiny lobsters and conch which I think is uh, pretty, pretty cool to see this kind of circular type regenerative or restorative practices where the seaweed farms are potentially contributing to recruitment of spiny lobster, which are, you know, what the fishermen, uh, you know, have seen less and less of of recent years and rely upon for their, their sources of livelihood. Uh, and then you know, the definition of restorative aquaculture, we've talked a lot about bivalves and seaweed, but it's not exclusive to those. And that was uh, raised by many people in the working group is, man, we really want to see how this concept plays out for finfish aquaculture and how does it play out in freshwater ecosystems. And, you know, the team did a lot of brainstorming on that. And, you know, I was less clear on the opportunities for that, this kind of thesis in the freshwater or finfish environment. But we did find a few that were, were compelling. And um, the example we, we came up with, thanks to our teams in China and researchers there, uh, they offered an example of uh, carp farming in reservoir systems, where actually this, the um, data, scientific data and papers around this are showing that uh, that farming is helping knock down um, algae uh, in those water bodies. So that was pretty interesting. But we continue to explore this. Uh, we're doing some work right now with the shrimp aquaculture sector and trying to figure out what restorative means when it comes to shrimp farming. Uh, so I think there's a lot of opportunity to expand this further and uh, refine uh, the definition, refine the applications to that space. And uh, I think everybody on this, on the working group team, uh, fully realizes that this was a first attempt at defining this and putting some guardrails around what we mean by this. Uh, and there's a lot of opportunity to take this to the, uh, to the next level uh, in subsequent versions. Uh, okay, so I think 
one point just to reiterate is all of this work was based on a foundation of science that TNC and partners have been developing over the past several years. Uh, I did want to pull out this chart from a paper that we just published in earlier this year, in February this year, uh, in ecosystem services. And this was a global level look. We did took a global level look at um, all of the reported studies around nitrogen removal by species group in an aquaculture setting. So we looked at nutrient or nitrogen removal um, and we're able to create global level averages in nitrogen removal for species groups and equate that into uh, dollar terms in terms of the benefit that uh, are provided by those farms. And we used um, as reference points the amount that would be required to mitigate that level of nitrogen through more traditional ways of wastewater treatment. So that's now out. I think it's uh, useful uh, information to inform this. It's useful to inform public policy decision making, as well as uh, investment decision making to know, you know, to translate those ecological values into economic terms. Uh, so you can compare it against other potential interventions. Uh, we did the same thing on habitat values. This is in the same paper. Uh, this is a chart from that same paper that gave average values in terms of additional production of fish that are coming off of, um, of individual farms. And we've generated those numbers on a per hectare per year basis. So, you know, what we're seeing was, you know, about, uh, about between 250 to 680 additional uh, individuals being produced per year. And that kind of translates into uh, a dollar dollar values of, you know, $1,000 to $2,500 in terms of commercial volume from, from the commercial fishing industry per year that these farms are generating. Okay, so I wanted to translate, talk a little, um, shift gears a little bit and talk about um, the SOAR program. And, um, you know, our perspective is, um, you know, for the most part, um, a lot of the bivalve and seaweed farming that occurs within the United States occurs under strict regulatory considerations um, and, you know, generally is providing some level of ecological value to the surrounding environment. Uh, it's an industry that's, um, you know, worthwhile uh, cultivating and a lot of our programs have been geared towards trying to get folks to get involved with shellfish and seaweed aquaculture and to develop those industries in a sustainable way. So, uh, well, I guess what could go wrong with that? Uh, I guess during the COVID-19 pandemic, the U.S. shellfish industry suffered um, some tremendously significant impacts uh, when restaurants closed down, 90% um, of sales were lost overnight from a lot of uh, a significant portion of the industry. Um, the reliance upon the half shell market and oysters in uh, restaurants was exposed quite quickly. Um, that resulted in increased surplus of oysters around farms. Uh, a lot of oversized oysters on farms beginning to stack up because they couldn't be sold and potentially would not be sellable. And what was happening was the farm uh, management cycle was starting to get um, uh, uh, in a log jam basically because they couldn't put new oysters out on those farms. So uh, we got together with a number of different partners, uh, including Pew Charitable Trusts, uh, the East Coast Shellfish Brewers Association, uh, USDA, NOAA as advisors, uh, as well as local partners to figure out what we should do about this. And uh, we determined that we could organize a system in which we purchase those excess oysters, help provide that COVID relief support to the industry, and then place those oysters on restoration sites. And we saw a significant value to this from a conservation perspective because um, these large adult oysters are actually um, quite important ecologically. Uh, they're the ones that, that breed. Most of them are female. Uh, and when reef sites set, set out, often they're smaller oysters and there's some value of having those larger broody size oysters out on those reefs. 
uh, and supplementing those reef systems. So uh, we set out and developed this purchase program uh, in between last year, uh, 2019 and 2020, or sorry, 2020 and 2021. Uh, TNC purchased over 3.5 million oysters uh, across seven states. We had over 125 growers participate in the program. Um, we projected, based on survey data we collected from participants, that over 450 jobs were sustained through this program. Um, those 3.5 million oysters went out on 40 acres of reefs across those uh, seven, actually six states in 25 different restoration sites. So this was a full court press to get this thing going and a tight timeline to provide that benefit to the farmers. Um, and it was quite an exciting project. The, we've gotten economic impact data back through survey results from the farmers. Um, I think this is quite indicative of um, the types of businesses that are most oyster farms today. Um, you know, 43% of the participants um, in this, the SOAR program, the oyster farmers reported generating uh, less than $50,000 of revenue per year. And that's in pre COVID 19 levels. So these are really mom and pop type operations. And on average, we bought about $13,000 per of worth of oysters per farmer and supported nearly basically a quarter of annual revenue of these growers pre-COVID. Um, two thirds of the farmers reported that this program was very beneficial to sustaining their, their, uh, their business through the COVID-19 crisis. So there's another component of SOAR, which has kind of uh, followed the purchase program. So we continued purchasing through um, fall of last year. But we also developed at the same time the shelf, Shore Shellfish Growers Resiliency Fund, which was a uh, program to go uh, beyond just relieving the immediate impact to, that was faced by farmers due to COVID-19, but help rebuild this industry in a um, way for the future uh, and address some of the underlying challenges associated with the industry. And the primary type um, we worked on this with a, a group, a diverse steering committee with, um, you know, about 15 different participants from NOAA, USDA, uh, grower representatives, um, as well as academic folks, folks representing um, Native American communities um, to develop a list of priorities on how we should uh, utilize the funding that we had available to support this industry. What we came up with was developing two essentially uh, grant competitions, one a small award and one a large, large award program. The small award under $20,000 in size was meant to target, target, target farmer innovation and to really tap into um, some of the ingenuity that these farmers have and to test out new projects in a, in a, a number of different priorities that you see here basically trying out new things that can help um, stabilize income, develop new markets, uh, build diversity, equity, inclusion into the shellfish industry and enhance sustainability, environmental sustainability of it. Um, we also um, funded some large awards under the program uh, in a number of different areas uh, as well. Some of the larger ticket items such as advancing nutrient trading markets, uh, we funded some work in that area. Uh, as well as advancing new, pro new products and species. Uh, some of those required a little bit more than 20,000 and um, into, um, institutions other than uh, just shellfish growers were eligible to apply for that. So a number of uh, academic groups were recipients of this funding. Uh, so we ended up funding 28 small awards, about $20,000 each and eight large awards. And some of the the, we just recently put up online the list of projects that were funded, but it's some really exciting stuff coming through. Uh, everything from, and this was national in scope, so everything from, you know, uh, in the Gulf of Mexico training um, Viet and Latino communities on oyster farming practices to using um, crab gear that would have gone to waste for, uh, to recycle them for shellfish aquaculture gear 
um, to testing a new species of clams out in California's coast. Um, so a whole lot of stuff to be excited about there. Uh, I'll just close by saying that we're likely to continue SOAR uh, in coming years. And really what we started out doing here was to build, to provide COVID relief for the, um, for the oyster aquaculture industry. But I think what we really were able to do was to build uh, a collaboration and a shared vision between NGO partners and the aquaculture industry on two grounds. One, to build a thriving and resilient shellfish industry, uh, which now we have NGOs buying into both at Pew and TNC and seeing the value of that. And then on the other side, accelerating the need to restore oyster reefs. And now we have um, 150 strong advocates to do that. 98% um, of the participants in SOAR said that they, were in, they would be interested in participating in SOAR and selling their oysters into a SOAR program for reef rebuilding. Uh, this coming year. So uh, we're, we're super excited about this program um, and the potential to continue it and to grow it uh, going forward. So uh, I'm going to stop there and open it up for questions. Thank you so much, Robert. That was really interesting. We might just keep your presentation up um, oh, okay. at least on hand. There might be some specific questions regarding the two big components. Um, we yeah, can I, can, I can go back to it. That'd um, be great. The first question it was posted from David. Um, it says the five-year revision of the MASA, which may be MASS, Ocean Management Plan included developing an aquaculture zone um, off Chatham Mass in waters 0.3 to three miles offshore. Was restorative aquaculture part of this dialogue? So I don't know. <laughs> I don't know in that particular um, context if restorative aquaculture was part of it. Uh, I will say this though, the concept of aquaculture zoning and area management, I think is really important. It's important to identify aquaculture sites for um, the potential to provide benefits, which is kind of this concept of restorative aquaculture, but also to make sure we're minimizing impact. And I think it's in everyone's interest um, to move forward with a protective, clear, and transparent uh, permitting review uh, process. And that has been a challenge for aquaculture. Uh, it's been a, you know, challenging to, to get a permit, sometimes rightfully so, but we really need to make sure that there's a, a protective uh, regulatory system in place. Sometimes that zoning is the best solution towards that, and sometimes zoning is not the right solution in that particular context, but generally speaking, that is one of the solutions that we're advocating for, for in the aquaculture space is moving towards zoning areas that are um, uh, pre-vetted from an environmental standpoint and uh, allow for you know, less burden on the applicant as a result of that um, and the strictest environmental protections. That's great. And Ben Getch from CRMC has a question very much related to that. I'll let him elaborate. Go ahead, Ben. Yeah. Um, thank you, Robert. Um, it's a great, great segue into what I was going to ask, um, which I was, you know, we are in the middle uh, um, of, you know, our Narragansett Bay Special Area Management Plan, which yeah. has a development for, for aquaculture. Um, we've done some um, changes to the program administratively already. Um, but as we continue uh, to look at um, other ways to develop this planning process, particularly as we move towards for rule changing or, or um, other other guidance, uh, I'm curious how how these principles could could be incorporated into our planning process. And with, with regards to zoning, I know that that is one option there, um, and I've looked at other other jurisdictions that have done zoning. Um, but I'm also curious about how the, these principles might inform uh, zoning, but also, you know, best management practices or, or things of that nature, uh, which, from what I can tell, can have a big impact on um, the success of the state's uh, aquaculture program as well. And I'm, I'm just really kind of interested in what, what types of information or, or data uh, are, are most important to, to consider in this process. Thank you. Yeah, so, I mean, on... Like I think the probably the most obvious um, 
opportunity is around this siting question and area management question where you know there it may make more sense for identifying or encouraging certain sites uh, based on the potential to provide environmental benefits like for example you know if we're trying to address nutrient mitigation uh, in a particular area uh, some areas might be better or worse served to do that um, for habitat provisioning as well, uh, thinking about the surrounding ecology and whether it's, sub, it's substrate hard limited, substrate limited in that area, and is it possible to potentially have some positive spill, spillover through these aquaculture sites and creating more uh, abundance of fish. Um, getting to best management practices, I think this is uh, a really good question. So because like our principles document is still like relatively high level and those are like general principles to use and like here's a framework and a roadmap to kind of work down that and to answer those questions. And I, I think just from that, there's probably some insights to inform your your question, your questions, but um, we're kind of taking this to the next level now. Um, we are working together with Bob Rowe and the East Coast Shellfish Growers Association to um, he's doing a refresh on best management practices for the shellfish aquaculture industry, the document that he developed with his um, his board and stakeholders year, several years ago. He is building a refresh of that and adding in a new section on uh, how to enhance ecological outcomes from shellfish aquaculture. So I think that's kind of like the next step there is to figure out what this looks like for particular industries and particular geographies. And I think that will be the first uh, to do that. And um, we're excited to see what, it, what, it, what will come out of it. So we did our a listen, a listening session um, around Aquaculture America. We had a session there and there will be another one at the Northeast Aquaculture Conference in Portland. Uh, later this month. So we'll do a presentation there and solicit the input from the broader aquaculture community on what those practices should be relative to the East Coast shellfish industry. That's great. Thanks, Robert. I know Thank Bob is here too, so he could chime in um, if he likes, and we will be He's graciously agreed to present in May for a webinar through this series, along with Chris Shalaki, looking at best management practices and some of the, the findings that you just spoke of. Um, we do have a question from Brian. Would you prefer to read it out, Brian? You're welcome to. I'm happy to as well. Just a moment here. Yeah, go ahead. Um, my concern is Narragansett Bay. Um, it's such a, a lovely spot, but are there any new plans as far as getting more reefs in Narragansett Bay, or is it just too deep at some parts? Mm. I, I actually couldn't answer that question, but I'm guessing probably somebody would know uh, the answer to that on this call. At URI, I guess. Oh, I, I can address that actually. Thank you, Aquaculture Coordinator at CRMC. Um, oh, yeah. We had a previous uh, educational webinar on restoration in the ocean state, in here in Rhode Island. And that was led by uh, Eric Schneider of the uh, Department of Environmental Management. And he is, uh, the CEM is currently going to undertake a, a shellfish restoration management plan uh, for the state. Uh, Rhode Island has not been participating in the SOAR program as described by Robert, but we do have a similar uh, program in many regards uh, through the USDA uh, Natural Resource Conservation Service. So that program also bought uh, was able to uh, you know obtain large oysters from farmers, uh, deploy them on reefs. Uh, we do have a number of of reef restoration projects throughout the state. Uh, many are in the salt ponds. Some are in Narragansett Bay, but uh, again are usually limited to uh, shallower. Uh, embayments or enclosures. Um, as you uh, pointed out, um, they don't always work well in deep water. However, historically, we have had natural oyster reefs um, in, in somewhat deeper water. Uh, going back to the late 90s, that was like the last time we saw a good set in the bay. And uh, particularly between Patience and Prudence Island, around Hog Island, there, there was a, a fairly uh, fairly good set of oysters uh, that did survive for, for a little while. Um, but yeah. But 
I, I've, I've noticed I used to be up at Edgewood Yacht Club as a steward and we'd go over and um, to the other side of the bay, I guess it would be Saban, around Saban Point. And you'd see oysters, uh, large ones sitting there seeding the bay. And uh, it, is, this, is the natural seeding working um, as far as clams and, I'm sorry, quahogs. <laughs> And uh, and also the oyster, uh, or are you actually just tr doing a transplanting to initiate new cultures? Uh, yes, yeah, so the, the reef restoration is is designed to create habitat uh, for one, increase water quality as well, yeah. but but also uh, you know inevitably have a self-sustaining reef. Um, that can be very hard in Rhode Island. We, we yeah. do not have a very much. Um, history with self-sustaining oyster populations, at least not in modern times. Um, yeah. Hence the importance of um, you know, having oyster aquaculture uh, for commercial purposes, which uh, puts those animals in our water and provides a similar benefit to, uh, to the natural populations. Yeah. Okay, well said, thank you. Thanks, Brian, thanks for your question. Um, Karen Brothers, would you like to read your great question out? Yeah, hi. Um, I was just um, wondering, I know the word regenerative and regenerative agriculture has become quite a buzzword, and I wondered if you have a take on it. I'd be interested to hear what you think about regenerative agriculture. I know some people are using the word, for example, Green Wave yeah. are using the term regenerative ocean farming. Um, and yeah, just wondering why you chose to use the word restorative, what your take is on regenerative, and what do you see as being the differences between the two? So that one's easy. We see, we see them as synonyms, and we wrote that in the report that restorative, we see restorative and regenerative as being interchangeable terms, and by that we mean the same thing. Uh, we have been using the term restorative for several years, and we kind of just stuck with it. Uh, so that's really the, the reason there. But um, I think the concept that Bren and Green Wave are promoting is similar in nature in terms of the regenerative outcomes that he's talking about are the same ones that we are um, striving to achieve with restorative aquaculture in terms of nutrient mitigation, habitat provisioning, and climate. Um, so, yeah. Uh, just good to go to back to some of the things that previous said. I think it was uh, Ben who mentioned the uh the that SOAR is not operational Rhode Island and the similar USDA program through the Natural Resource Conservation Service uh that is ongoing there and that's the reason why we didn't deploy SOAR in Rhode Island is because there was a, an influx of funding going towards that USDA program that more or less had um Rhode Island growers covered uh that was uh also in the guidance of of industry and um Bob and and others indicating where we could use these funds to be of uh, most help. And I didn't hear what you said earlier, Ezra, about Bob actually being on the line. So if <laughs> not to put you on the spot, Bob, but if you did want to add anything on the effort you're going on on the BMP, um, the BMP document more than more than uh, helpful to for you to chime in as well. And I might just let um, Christine hailing all the way from Norway, uh, ask her question, Bob, and then I'll give you give you the floor to elaborate if you don't mind. Christine, would you like to share your question? Sure, sure. Hi. So um, I'm an American, but I live in northern Norway um, near Tromsø, and um, we we live on a sheep farm in an inland fjord called Balsfjord, which is a tertial fjord. It has uh, meaning it has like a it's a it's a long narrow fjord with a like a ridge underwater that means that the water exchange is very low and um it's one of only three fjords uh in our area that doesn't have salmon farming um and the salmon farming industry uh um basically they say they want to double the amount of salmon farms five times in the next 25 years so the industry has a very big expansion ambition but um the local uh, municipal government and our little village, we have like a little, um, a local, it's called a development committee. Um, 
we're essentially rejecting uh, new proposals from, from commercial salmon farms and now a cod farm has come and proposed. Um, but the real question is, is that uh, the local economy is really struggling over the last 30, 40 years. Um, and, and there's a question, is there a different kind of development that might include some kind of restorative option um, for us that could actually support the local economy. We also have a large amount of migratory uh, birds. So Ballsfjord is actually an international, um, a, a site of international recognition and, and conservation for, um, for migratory seabirds, um, including red knots. And, um, and of course we wouldn't wanna do anything to further degrade the fjord, I don't know, there's a lot of research been done in this fjord, which I don't have access to, although I've been thinking about trying to get it. I'm a, a filmmaker and an artist, um, totally not a professional uh, farmer or, or obviously not aquaculture person. But I was just wondering if the committee could actually look at something that would say, OK, we do want to develop, but we don't want to go in this commercial um, way that we've been really resisting for for many years. Yeah, I mean, I think you highlighted one of the fundamental challenges of uh, marine cage culture and the environment, which is you know, the nutrient effluent prob problems associated with fin fish farms. Uh, that's a significant consideration. Um, another one is impact to wild stocks. Uh, the solution as we see it is uh, offshore cage culture or recirculating aquaculture systems. Um, that technology is advancing rapidly, and um, we can do it if uh, we're regulating towards those industries. So that's what we see as being important and what we're promoting in finfish aquaculture is a transition to offshore cage culture and recirculating technologies. Um, in terms of other opportunities, yeah, I mean, it's not just fish, right, that can work here. You know, this, there's a lot of excitement about seaweed, including in Norway. Um, and as well as, you know, the Faroe Islands, there's projects going on, uh, Denmark and other places. Um, so that could be one. I mean, I think the challenges uh, that we've seen with seaweed right now is uh, finding the appropriate markets for that seaweed, right? It's like, we can grow it now. It's just where, <laughs> where are folks going to sell it? And I think that's uh, something that we are, um, working more on at TNC is working with uh, major companies to figure out, you know, how they can use seaweed in their supply chains to improve the sustainability of it and create a, you know, a more significant uh, market at price for it. So seaweed is something definitely to look into. Uh, there may be some opportunities around bivalves depending upon um, your, the water quality or the, yeah, the water quality and temperature and the appropriate species that are there, so. Robert, it looks like um, Christine had a follow on as to what you mean by offshore, whether land based or in deeper water. Uh, deeper, deeper water ocean conditions. Great, great questions. Bob, bro, do you want to say a few words about the work you're doing? Let me give you a, a few minutes to do so if you'd like. Yeah, we're, you know, we're excited about the uh, opportunities to investigate you know, what growers might do to improve their economic benefits. I mean, we're, we're very proud of the benefits that we provide. Um, and I just wanted to, to offer to the woman from Norway, there was a considerable amount of studies done growing mussels in one of the fjords. There was a, a small town that was being challenged. They were exceeding the, the nitrogen that was being released from their wastewater treatment plant. Uh, and they decided that for they didn't really have land space that they could uh, Im improve their wastewater treatment plant, so they invested in a off in a mussel farm that was able to completely uh, absorb the nitrogen that was being released from that small town, um, and then they were using the, those mussels for chicken feed and fertilizer. Um, so that was an interesting experiment. I do, I do recognize that, that finfish have some, some challenges uh, that, you know, really sort of beyond what we're talking about here because we don't do finfish culture in Narragansett Bay. I did see a question, you know, is seaweed an option for us? I suppose I should let Azure take that, but yes, absolutely. Kelp 
kelp grows very well in, in Rhode Island waters. Um, it's just, uh, as, as Robert mentioned, the, the processing and, and sales uh, has yet to catch up, I think, with our ability to grow it. So but we're, we're on the cusp. I think I'm very excited about the, the prospects for, for kelp farming in New England waters uh, and other seaweed types as well. Um, but yes, uh, in terms of the BMPs, we're, we're looking at, you know, how can we improve the habitat value? And we're seeing already that um, typically shellfish gear provides excellent habitat for juvenile fish. And in, in almost all of our New England waters, we're seeing that this uh, rocky reef habitat is a limited habitat variety. And so um, we're, we're very excited about, um, and what can we do to optimize that, maximize that, improve the, the, the habitat benefits. Um, I've always known that, that my, my farm is a great place to go fishing. So um, that's, that's about all I've got right now. We're working on developing more. Um, certainly the, the nutrient benefits uh, have been well studied and, and well documented. Um, and I'm, I probably don't have time to go into that here, but uh, you know, we're, we're excited about being good players. I see it as a win-win-win uh, in terms of benefits to the environment, jobs, economic development, and sustainable seafood. So, Thanks, Bob. That's great. Thank you for, for clarifying. We're, we're looking forward to your May presentation. Um, one sort of emphasis from David on his previous question, he says the nearshore waters off of Chatham, Massachusetts, suffer from PFAS contamination, nitrogen enrichment, climate change uh, impacts. So. And then I'll let, in our final moment, Kenny, I know you have a question. I'll let you pose that if you'd like before we wrap up. If not, I'm happy to read it. Kenny asks, one of the principles mentioned surrounds how to minimize impact when siting of aquaculture. Rhode Island has a well-utilized coastline. What are best management practices when dealing with aquaculture and conflicts with recreational use? You have some thoughts on that, Robert? Well, I mean, I think, you know, communities need to figure out how to best collectively use their waterways. And certainly there's a lot of stuff going on in Narragansett Bay in terms of recreational fishing and sailing and all of that. So I think all of that needs to be taken into consideration. Um, the more that we can be data driven in those uh, discussions and informing uh, where's the right place to do aquaculture, the better we can be. I think that is really important to kind of move past uh, these sometimes contentious uh, public discussions uh, around aquaculture. So, you know, I would advocate for that, like the data collection around how the marine environment is being used and using that to inform future uses is, is important. Fantastic. And then a, a shout out from Jeff Gardner uh, to the Nature Conservancy's work. And he said that the work you did um, and have been doing has literally saved many of the businesses in Rhode Island. So thank, thank you. It's a nice ending point there. So with that, I will wrap up to respect, every, respect everyone's time. Again, this has been recorded. We'll post it on the Baysamp website. Thank you all for joining, Robert. Thank you, especially for your time and your really great, very interesting work. Um, and we wish you all a fantastic evening. Thank you. Thanks so much. Take care.